Good evening, everybody, and welcome to October. It's great to be with all of you again. Um, I hope you have a uh, are having a fantastic day, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, I know for a lot of us in the South, we finally got some cooler weather, which is phenomenal. It's been ridiculously hot for fall up until today, and we finally got some good rains and got some cooler weather, which I am so thrilled about. Um, and hopefully it's here to stay. I'm really, really hoping that the cooler weather is finally here to stay. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Blake. I'm one of the owners of the Bee Supply. And uh, one of my favorite things that I get to do when I'm not working bees is to educate about bees and beekeeping. And so these Thursday nights are always one of the highlights for me when I get to talk bees for an hour and a half. Uh, we've got a lot of special things going on tonight. We have our live in the bee yard as usual. We've got um, a great overview of the magazine by Sherry, and then we're going to spend the bulk of our time with Cayman Reynolds tonight, which is always a treat, and we'll get to that uh, later on in the evening where we'll do some live Q&A. Um, and so in lieu of that, if you have questions for Cayman that you want to ask on the live Q&A, you can go ahead and put those in the Q&A box. Just put Cayman in front of those questions so that James and Sherry don't answer those um, as we're going along. If you just have general questions, put them in that Q&A box and James and Sherry will answer those as we go through the evening. Um, otherwise, put Cayman in front if it's a really uh, special question and Cayman and I will get to that later on this evening. So with that, let's jump into a few things before we go see what the bees are doing out in the bee yard. Uh, the first big announcement is if you are needing some bees for 2024, um, our bees are live on our website. You can now place those orders for 2024. Uh, we have our 14 day guarantee. So if anything goes wrong with your bees in the first 14 days, just return them. We'll be happy to take them back. Our policy on that is always, look, if you bring the bees back and they had a problem, we're so happy that we were able to get them back and exchange them for you. If you bring them back and there was nothing wrong with them, which is usually what happens, um, then we are able to double check, let them sit for about a week, make sure everything's okay, and then resell them. So uh, we usually have about a 1% or less than 1% issue rate, uh, but issues do happen. You know, bees are, these are live animals that we're transporting and moving and switching into equipment. And we really want to make sure you get a great start in beekeeping, which is why we do that 14-day guarantee. Uh, package bees. So right now on our website to that, so far we have just had singles and nooks available. Uh, package bees go on sale tomorrow. Um, those early dates sell out really fast. We have a date. Um, our first pickup date for packages is going to be in March, which is crazy early. So if you want to get a huge jump start on your beekeeping journey, We'll have packages available in March, and those go on pre-sale tomorrow. You'll want to jump on that fast because those early dates will sell out really, really quickly. So um, these are my girls, uh, two, my two girls. Actually, this was about um, three years ago now, actually. They look really different than that now. But uh, I brought a package of bees home. I cannot remember for the life of me why I had a package of bees in my car. I just usually have like a random nook in the back of my truck or queen bees in my truck. Or, um, and I had a package of bees. And so they got to uh, watch it for a day and absolutely loved it. So um, we are also introducing bulk bee pricing. So if you buy multiple nooks or multiple singles, multiple packages, uh, you get better pricing. Um, and then we'll actually sell you, hey, if you want 90 plus nooks or 90 plus singles, uh, we'll sell them to you uh, in bulk and you'll even get a better price. But we are introducing, and this is live on our website, bulk pricing for those that are buying several units. So little tip, if you want to get together with uh, all your friends at your local bee club and uh, get really crazy good pricing on nooks or singles, hit us up. We can certainly handle that for you. Since we raise all of our own bees, um, we're able to offer some pretty good bulk pricing as well. Last little advertisement here for the next 72 hours, we are doing a promotion where uh, you get a $25 gift card every time you purchase a single story of bees. And this is for every single story hive. So if you go buy 10 single story hives, um, you're going to get $250 in gift cards. So that's for the next 72 hours um, that we're doing that little promotion. So 
check it out. It's on our website. Um, just buy any single and then we'll email you uh, those gift cards. Oh, shoot. I said that was the last thing um, I forgot. The global pollen patties with complete and rocket fuel are back in stock next week. So if you want to get some of those just in time for uh, getting your bees ready for winter, we have standard global patties available now. Uh, but if you want the ones with complete or rocket fuel, uh, those will be back in stock next week. Sherry, what do we have going on this week uh, or this month on the magazine? How do you like that cover? Oh, I think you're muted, Sherry. Oh, sorry. No, I'm not. I can. I shows oh, Sherry, we can't hear you for some reason. Wow. It shows you're not muted, but uh, we cannot hear you. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. Strange. We still can't hear you. Oh, no. Um, oh, no. Let me. Um, still nothing. Unless it's just me. I, I can I can hear it just fine. And all you guys not here? Oh, oh, oh yeah. you guys can hear. can hear me. Well, so I can't there hear you, you go. I want to I want to hear you, what Kevin. you have to say. I I can't hear you. All right, well go well, ahead, Sherry. I'll For do some reason, hand signal. It's just on like... me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> go um, ahead. Everybody this... else can hear you. Okay. <laughs> so that cover is cool. Is that not cool? It's this is what you call employees that have a good sense of humor went across the street from the Blue Ridge store and put their bee suits on and decided to be beekeepers of the corn. I loved it. So I made it the cover. This month is, are you ready? Drum roll. It's my 40th issue, not mine. It feels like my baby, but it's the V supplies 40th issue. That's a big deal. I mean, 40, that's a bunch of them. We've got a ton of in this in this issue, the October issue. But I do want to say all of those past 40 issues are on the website. So you can go back and and don't judge me. The first ones weren't as good as the as I got at putting one together later on. But that's all right. That's all right. So um this month's topics, we had several good ones. What's going on in your hive right now? And we address all geographic areas and that. So that really helps you. Thinking outside the hive box. I love that little short and I can't do it every month, but the, the young lady, Ginger Mallard from Honolulu, Hawaii, um, which is super cool that we've got people all over the world watching us, submitted her genius idea of getting the bees to clean your crushed and strained comb. Go in and see that. I had never thought of it. I thought, gosh, duh, why didn't I think of it? Super great um, idea. And a uh, story and a half hives perfectly ready for winter. That's a Blake Shook uh, little short article with a, a video, super informative. And I have a nice little video of uh, an interview with a guy that I think that we all know that happens to be on our, as our guest tonight, Cayman Reynolds on page 28. Please go watch it. Cayman, you and I had a good time on that interview, right? Yes. <laughs> Yes, we did. I, I muted myself. I, I figured I'd no, stay out of good. it. You're good. Um, but it is. It's a good interview. Y'all y'all check it out. All right, Blake, if you can hear me, go to the spotlight. Can you hear me now? I still can't hear you, Sherry, but I'm reading your gestures as best <laughs> I can. So I'm working on it on my side. I lo I'm loving your gestures. I mean, I, I, I can uh, almost tell what you're saying. Just Oh, that's gestures, frightening. But but keep going. I'm working on my audio over here. <laughs> okay, that's frightening. All right. So this October issue, the pick I did uh, for y'all is the snapshot is called uh, Storing Hive Equipment and Drawn Comb Frames Over Winter. And um, our blue, uh, our sorry, Dayton manager, Paul Fagala, and I kind of paired up on this article. And it's really good information. You don't think so much about storing equipment. We always think about storing drawn comb, but equipment's kind of a deal as well. Um, think about what you've got and how much of it you've got. That can kind of be a challenge, right? So in this article, we kind of get in detail about multiple boxes. That's one thing that James and I've had to deal with for years and years. You've got all these boxes that are empty, not no frames. What am I going to do with them? You don't want to stack them on the ground because ground contact will rot them prematurely. Um, you can um, set them up on some blocks and cross hatch them all the way up 
or you can stack two boxes and then they'll start slipping into each other. That really works the best. Just make sure they're off of the ground. Um, and I love this. I found this on BIP, B Informed Partnership. Dan Wynn, which has been with them for a long time, he has a story of an article he wrote on their website and I made a QR code to jump to it. It uh, shows you the dolly project. So he made a dolly to go underneath those stacks of empty boxes so he could move them around in his garage. I thought it was an excellent idea. Harrison Rogers had that idea a couple of years ago for us too. Then there's uh, the frames, which we've all kind of been there, done that, right? Or at least if you haven't, you will be very soon. Um, Sertan is a product that we uh, came out with, that we started carrying this year, and it, I'm not going to say it replaces Paramoth, it's a completely different product than Paramoth, um, we're familiar, those that have been in beekeeping for a minute, of Paramoth is the, it smells, smells like moth crystals, Sertan does not, it has no smell, and you don't even have to store your frames in a container once you've sprayed, it's you. It's a dilution, um, 19 to one dilution. You spray it on the frames, let them dry, and then you can store them in boxes open. How great is that? Plus it's environmentally friendly product, which we, <clears throat> we love, no more airing frames for that. And then we still can do Paramoth if you want. Super bags, another product that we started carrying this year. Wonderful product if you're using Paramoth because you don't have to keep re-adding the Paramoth. Uh, how many times he can raise his hand? How many times has he had to go back in that stack and add Paramoth? Yep, see, multiple. In the super bag, you don't have to. It's a nice big bag with a zipper, nylon bag with a zipper. It seals it in there and keeps it snug as a bug in a rug. Anyway, check that article out. That's on page 34. And Blake, if you can see my hand signals, I'm done. Yes, I, I can actually hear you now. So I just oh. had to uh, reset my audio. So yeah, I got to, I got to hear. All I'm that. just glad it wasn't awesome. me this time. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I was like, oh no, nobody can hear. And then everybody's commenting like, oh no, we can hear. And it's like, wow, okay. I guess it's just me. Thank goodness. Um, okay, let's jump out into the bee yard. Let's see what the bees are doing. And then when we come back, um, we'll get into that live Q&A. We're going to do things a little bit differently. And and uh, to be fair, I didn't warn Cayman about this, uh, but hey, uh, he can, he's super adaptable. But we're just going to kind of go through the rest of our normal PowerPoint of topics of what you need to be doing to help prepare your bees for winter. And um, Cayman and I will just discuss those various topics um, and then you guys can chime in with questions as we go. So start thinking about the questions that you have for preparing your bees for winter. Um, and we will come to that Q&A portion uh, right after we see what the bees are up to. So let's jump out into the bee yard and we'll be back shortly. Hey, good evening, friends. Um, I have, it's the last really warm day out here in the bee yard. I mean, I don't know if, where you're from watching tonight, but where I'm from in Texas, it's like the heat just wouldn't stop. I mean, the whole month of September, we got like one week in there where it was in the 70s and 80s, and we all thought, hey, fall is here. And then, nope, we were back up in the 90s and low hundreds up until tomorrow. And so for Texas, at least, it's cooling off tomorrow, and it looks like we're actually going to enter into a little bit of fall weather, which is fantastic. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in the BR today because we have Cayman Reynolds with us tonight. And so you don't want to see me spending a lot of time in the BR. You want to get to Cayman and I want to get to Cayman. And so let's, uh, I'm going to spend a little less time than normal as we run through some quick scenarios out here in the BR. And then we'll jump back into the webinar to get some of your questions answered. So uh, we'll talk in a little more detail with Cayman about fall preparation and winter preparation, what you should and shouldn't be doing. Uh, but for now, let's look at a few hives and then let's get to that Q&A. So adding and taking away boxes before winter time, what do you need to know? Uh, here's the key components, okay? If a hive is really strong, you know, if, if all the boxes on the hive are completely full of bees, full of honey, full of brood, this time of year, this is early October, anywhere in the country, um, I'm not going to keep adding boxes. So once you get to uh, early October, swarming, the threat of swarming is past. I love to see all my boxes full of bees. I'm still not going to add boxes. 
So from now until next year, you know, February, March, April, depending on where in the country you are, I'm not going to be adding boxes. So my main role right now is making sure that I don't have too many boxes. And really, I'm only concerned about too many boxes if a box is just completely empty. If a box is completely empty, not a bad idea to pull it off, as long as the bees have enough honey in the lower or other boxes to sustain them through the winter. So if, you know, if I'm going through this hive and the top box is just completely empty and the bottom two boxes um, are uh, you know, full of bees and full of honey, I'm gonna pull that top box off. Anytime, anytime really between now and March, I'm gonna make that happen. Um, if I'm going through this hive and a common thing that you see is that the bottom box is almost completely empty and the bees and the brood have all moved up into the upper boxes, then again, I'm gonna go pull that bottom box out. So anytime between now and spring, if a box is completely empty, um, doesn't have a lot of resources in it, doesn't hurt to just pull it off and, and let the bees you know, focus on the space that they do have. So that's kind of what we're targeting this time of year when it comes to boxes. Now, um, if a hive is really weak and they're not even filling up the boxes that they do have, so let's take a look at this hive and I'm looking at the upper box. The upper box is pretty much empty. I mean, I've got a few bees running around up there, but it's like maybe, I don't know, like a frame of bees cumulative. They're just kind of up there because they're hanging out. So not a lot going on in that box. The next box down, again, a couple of frames of bees, not a whole lot. The bottom box, is completely empty. So essentially what this hive is, is they've got three frames, maybe four frames of bees, and that's about it. So it's not a very strong hive. So I've got, I can do one of two things. I can consolidate all the bees, brood, and honey into one box. So I can just make sure this box has, you know, four to six frames of honey, a couple of fairly empty frames, and maybe my brood in the middle, and then I can leave them a single story hive. But if it's pretty weak, the other option is to put them in a nook box. And so you can get a wooden nook box, just like this. Um, we have these, we sell these. So it's just a five frame wooden nook box with a telescoping lid and an inner cover. And you can transfer these weak little hives into this wooden nook box. And they overwinter much, much better in these wooden nook boxes than in you know double deep hive you know with a bunch of empty space in it lots of people overwinter these nooks so if you have a really small weak hive um, i would say in the three to four frames of bees range you can transfer them into this nook and they've got a much better chance at overwintering successfully if there are you know five six seven frames of bees don't don't worry you can leave them in a single if they're like one or two frames of bees it's probably better to go ahead and combine it with another hive than trying to save it. The one note I will make though, is before you transfer this and try to save a weak hive in a nook box over the winter, it's important to understand why it's so weak. If it's because it's queenless, it's not gonna help to transfer it into a new box. If it's because they've got tremendous varroa mite problems, again, nook box isn't gonna help you. But if you have a hive that doesn't have high varroa mites, they have a healthy laying queen, they don't have a bunch of fowl brood, and they're just weak and small, then transferring them into one of these nook boxes is a great way to ensure that they survive the winter. So honey bound hives. This is a fairly common problem, especially on years where there's a decent nectar flow, is you can have a hive that brings in so much nectar, they fill up all their space and the queen has nowhere to lay. This is a bigger problem in the spring and the summer when we really wanna make sure the queen has tons of room to lay um, usually in those times of year, you can just keep adding boxes and the bees will just keep moving that nectar and honey up, keeping the brood nest clear. Where it gets a little bit tricky is this time of year. You know, this is October. And so we want our bees to be storing a lot of honey, but we still want them to leave a little bit of room uh, for the queen to lay because we want her to keep laying brood as long as possible. If you're in the southern half of the United States, you know, you probably have a month to a month and a half left of some brood production. The northern half is really wrapping it up here in the next couple of weeks, depending on exactly where you are.
But in whatever case, it's a delicate balance of making sure the hive has enough food, but not too much. So here's what I do. Number one, if I have excess food in a hive, um, I am very quick, as long as it's a healthy hive, to shake the bees off of a frame of honey and go give it to a weaker hive that could use that food. Or in some cases, if I have a hive that's almost dead and they have a box full of honey, I might take that entire box and put that entire box of honey on a different hive that needs food. So you can move honey around uh, between hives as long as it's coming from a healthy hive. Um, and really by that, I just mean you don't want a hive that had foul brood everywhere uh, and, and you don't want to transfer that foul brood. So as long as you, know, you didn't have a foul brood problem, it's fine to transfer honey around. But this is a good candidate of what I'm talking about. So this hive, we've got two deep boxes and a medium box. This top deep box is completely full of capped honey. I mean, take my word for it. Well, hey, we're in the bees. It wouldn't be fun if we didn't look at some frames of honey, check out what's going on. That's what we're here for. So, I mean, every single frame looks just like this one. I mean, it's a, it's a frame, this is a medium box. Every frame is completely full of capped honey. Both sides, absolutely beautiful. This is what we want to see this time of year. They've done a great job. Um, we had some of Stan's soft sugar bricks on this hive and pollen patties, and the bees in this yard have just done phenomenally well, thanks to Shannon and thanks to the sugar bricks, the pollen patties, and mite treatment. Um, every hive in this yard is just essentially, except for the one I showed you earlier, is bursting at the seams. So they've done a great job. Um, the, that top box is completely full. When I look at this bottom box, um, it's pretty full as well. When I lift up on it, I'm sorry, when I look at the second box, oh, it's probably got another 30 pounds of honey in it. And so I'm going to dive down into the brood nest to see what I can see. So this is, this is really, wow. Um, so this is one of our golden Cordovan hives. Check out that brood. <laughs> kind of crazy for April. I mean, I mean, sorry, it wouldn't be crazy for April. Uh, it's kind of crazy for October. <laughs> so um, beautiful, beautiful brood. Completely just a great brood pattern. This side, you can see we've got a little bit of honey around the edges, a ton of brood in the middle. So even though even though they've got a lot of honey up in that second box, the bees are still able to keep enough space clear in the brood box to continue rearing brood. Now, this is, this is what I'm looking for. Um, well, first of all, there's the queen. There's our uh, golden Cordovan queen right there. You can see it, she's kind of pretty light in color. So there she is, she's happy and still laying. But one of the key signs for me to see if a hive is honey bound or not is, is there open space where the queen is laying? So if you take a look at this frame, you've got cap brood, you've got all this open space and the queen's actually actively laying in it right now. And I've got multiple frames in the hive like this where again, some honey on the outside edge, cap brood, open space in the middle. So the bees are not backfilling all this open space in the brood nest with honey. You can see they're starting to do it over here on the edge. So you can see that there was cat brood all over here. And as this brood is hatching, the bees are starting to fill all this area with nectar. And so they're kind of starting to shrink the area that the queen can lay. That's very, very normal to see going into the winter. Um, but again, they've still got four or five, six frames available in that brood nest for the queen to lay in. I've also got my outside frames look like this. So you can see the bees are starting to fill them with uh, honey and nectar or syrup, depending on if you're feeding them or not. And that's okay too. I mean, I wanna see three, four or five frames on the outside edge of that brood nest full of honey. And those inside frames are still reserved for, for brood rearing. So if you're going through a hive and they are totally backfilling the whole brood nest area, that's when you definitely want to stop feeding um, or pull some frames of honey out and give them to weaker hives and put some empty frames in the middle so that they can keep rearing that brood. Um, I'm going to correct myself there. I should just edit that out, but editing is such a pain. Um, <laughs> if you put deep frames of comb back in the hive, you want to put it on the outside edges of the brood nest. So for example, um, 
I'm going to show you on a medium box because so, I can tip it up on edge. So if this, if these middle three frames were my brood nest area and one of them I wanted to pull out because they were filling it completely full of honey. Let's say I pulled this frame out, it was full of honey, I gave it to another hive, and then I brought an empty frame back. Um, I would want to put it on, I wouldn't put it between these two frames of brood because I'd never want to break up my brood nest. I would put it on the outside edge of where my brood is. So the principle is you never want to separate your brood. You can put those empty frames on the outside edge of where your brood is and then the queen can move to them and lay there. So, but overall, um, the key is that if you've got a hive that has um, an excess of honey, you can move that honey around to other hives. Uh, but in this case, this hive is exactly what I want to see, which is they still have room available in the brood nest for the queen to lay, but they have a very healthy amount of honey to survive the winter months. Should you vent a hive in the winter? If you read a lot of the material, you'll see that sometimes condensation can build up on the underside of the lid inside of a hive during the winter because you've got warm bees, warm air rising, coming in contact with cold air, and that can create condensation on the, under, on the underside of the lid that rains down on the bees. That's super unhealthy. But one of the things that you can do is create an upper entrance to give them a little bit of airflow, and that helps cut down on that condensation. Now in the south, it's not nearly as big of a deal as further north, but you're in luck. Most inner covers come with a little notch cut in the inner cover, and you'll be able to see that right here, that little notch. And that helps create a little bit of that upper airflow so that even when it's installed and the, in, the top entrance is on, or the, the telescoping cover's on, it creates a little bit of airflow, and that is super helpful when it comes to keeping that condensation at bay. If your inner cover does not have that notch, it's super simple. You can just cut a little notch in it, or you can even get a popsicle stick and put it between the top box and the inner cover just to give them a slight gap, and then reinstall your top cover, and that creates enough of a gap to give them a little bit of that airflow. A common question as our bees start to dwindle and the brood rearing decreases and we're getting ready to go into the winter months is how do I tell if my queen is failing or my hive is just naturally dwindling and the brood is reducing because of the season? Now, the quick answer to this is that's why it's so important to have more than one hive because then you've got a comparison point. You can say, how does the brood in this hive look? compared to my other two hives? How does the bee population decline uh, and look in this hive compared to my other two or three or 10 hives? Having that comparison is so important. You know, if I just had one beehive, even commercially, I mean, it would be, if I had one beehive in one location, it would be hard for me to tell sometimes, you know, is this a problem or not? I'm constantly comparing and contrasting hives uh, with each other as I'm working bees. And so, it's natural to have some decline in population, but really this time of year, early October, our hive populations should be quite high. This is really the, as good as it's gonna get um, all winter long. It's gonna be downhill from here. So if you've got a hive that's struggling, it's not gonna get better from here. It's gonna get worse from here. So it's time to combine it with another hive or transfer it to a smaller nook box or something if it's you know below four frames of bees. Um, because it's not going to typically get better from here. Now, when I'm going through a hive this time of year, um, what am I looking for uh, as far as a problem? You know, again, if they have less than a deep box full of bees, then I'm a little concerned. Something's going on with that hive, and usually the culprit is varroa mites are not having fed enough. But when it comes to brood, Again, I'm comparing how many frames of brood does this potentially problem hive have compared to all my other hives. And then what does the brood look like? So let's just look at a few things. For me, the telltale signs is, do I see larvae that are crumpled or yellow or twisted looking? How does my larva look? Um, this frame, it's getting kind of uh, cloudy out here. It's gonna rain hopefully soon. It hadn't rained much in forever. So 
hopefully it rains. But this frame uh, has cat brood and pollen uh, and some capped honey on it. So you can maybe see that, uh, that yellow and orange pollen in those cells mixed with the cat brood. This is pretty common this time of year where you start to see the bees mixing in pollen and nectar with all of your brood. So it makes it very difficult to see if your queen has a good pattern or not. So you can see like on this frame, it almost looks like a really spotty brood pattern because you've got this scattered cat brood mixed with pollen. But in many cases, it's just because the queen is laying around pollen or honey that are already in that frame. And so what I do, if I see a frame like this where that brood looks a little bit spotty, is I'm gonna look at the other frames in the hive and see if I can find a frame that does have a good brood pattern. And so here we go. This is exactly what I'm looking for. So this frame has a pretty good brood pattern. You can see that this whole section here, the queen did a very good job of laying in a very compact brood pattern. So when I find a few frames where they have sections of pretty compact brood pattern, I'm really not worried about them. I say, you know what, I'm not going to blame the queen uh, for a couple frames that had spotty brood. It's probably just because, she, again, she was laying around um, pollen and nectar that the bees have brought in and started backfilling because we're getting closer to winter. The other thing I'm going to look for is just the quantity of brood. You know, does this hive have the same quantity of brood that my other hives have? And if it's, you know, several frames off, then I might have an issue. But as long as it's within a couple frames, I'm not too concerned. You can see there's, again, a good brood pattern um, on both sides. She's got a perfectly fine brood pattern. Everything looks very, very healthy. I, you won't be able to see it in the video, but there is quite a bit of larva in this hive. And that larva just looks very, very pearly white. Shiny, pearly white, that's what I'm looking for. I don't want to see twisted yellow, etc. Um, usually, when you have a bad queen and bad brood, you know it when you see it, <laughs> you know? Especially, again, if you've got a couple different hives you're comparing it to. You'll go through a hive that looks like this. It's got that nice compact pattern, at least on a few frames. The larva looks pearly white and shiny. And then you'll get to a bad hive, and it just looks terrible. And that compare and contrast is the best way this time of year to tell if you have a problem or not. So um, again, that brood should look compact. It should, the larva should look pearly white. Um, and as long as you've got that, then you probably do not have an issue. If you do have a queen issue this late in the season, the best bet in general is to just combine that hive with another hive. We've got a lot of other videos on how to combine hives. You can check those out on our YouTube channel. But it's hard to get a hive to survive the entire winter um, with no queen. They might survive, but there's a good chance there'll be a drone layer when they come out on the other side. Um, and they probably won't rebound in the spring. So if you lose a queen or have a very, very poor queen this time of year, it's usually better just to go ahead and combine that hive with another one. But compare it with your other hives to make sure it's actually the queen's fault. Over to our PowerPoint and full video backup. So uh, with that, let's, um, let's jump into October tips. One quick thing before I bring Cayman on here, this is just uh, where some of our bees are commercially right now. So our commercially operated bees um, spend the summer up in the Dakotas. They spend the spring in Texas where it's nice and cool. And then they um, spend the summer up in the Dakotas making a second honey crop where it's still nice and cool. And then as of, I think, Tuesday, they will all have been shipped from North Dakota into these sheds in Idaho. And these are completely climate controlled, humidity controlled, CO2 levels controlled. Uh, they're kept at 43 degrees. It's the perfect hibernation temperature for bees. So they're in there from October through late January hibernating. And uh, instead of eating 40 pounds of honey like they do if we overwintered in Texas, they only eat about 12 pounds of honey. And so um, it's a fantastic way to overwinter bees and they only lose about a frame, one to two frames of bees over the course of the winter, instead of six or seven frames that we often see when they're outside of sheds. Um, one last quick thing I wanna mention, the, um, 
the goldenrod is blooming. And if you are walking around your bee yard and you wonder, what is that smell? It's that, that's, everybody calls it like a stinky sock smell. And I guess it does smell like that. But I actually, when I smell it, I go, all oh, right, that means the bees are bringing in that fall nectar. Uh, but that goldenrod gives your bees, the bee yard in the evenings, kind of this musty, musty smell is the best way I can describe it. And so you might be smelling goldenrod in, in your bees, or you might just need to change your socks. I don't know. Could be, could be either. Um, you might also be seeing a little bit of honeydew, depending on your area. You can see the kind of this brown spot underneath this tree. That's from honeydew. I'm not seeing a lot of it this year. Um, I started seeing it. I saw a lot of it last year, but not a whole lot of it this year. Um, last couple of things here. These are current conditions. This is what I'm seeing uh, right now. You can see that the drought is certainly prevalent in the southern United States and into the central and the northwest. East Coast isn't too bad. Um, it's not great, but it's not too bad. But in some areas where, the, especially in Louisiana, you know, the bees are kind of struggling coming out of that fall dearth and trying to ramp up that winter bee population, um, especially in these drought areas, that's where feeding some pollen substitute can be super helpful to make sure the bees have the nutrients they need to overwinter successfully. Just to make you feel a little bit better, this is the drought map from the same time of year last year. So Texas is a little bit worse this year. Louisiana um, is tremendously worse this year, but the central United States and certainly the Western United States was, was worse last year. So something about the East over there, you know, uh, Cayman's territory just looking pretty beautiful uh, year after year. So I think that's the, the Mecca of beekeeping apparently. So. I'm going to launch this one poll and then we're going to get to Cayman. Um, this is a poll. Uh, I'm just curious as we compare years, are your hives healthier this year or were they healthier last year? So the question is compared to this time last year, do you feel that your hives are healthier and stronger or weaker? And so you can collect, you can select healthier or stronger, the same weaker. Um, just curious what uh, what you're seeing in your bees as compared to last year. Um, so most of you have voted and um, it looks like about 45% of you are saying that your bees are better this year. So about 45% healthier and stronger bees this year. Great job. You should pat yourself on the back. About 32% of you say the bees are the same. About 26% of you say that the bees are weaker. Um, hey, for those of you that say your bees are weaker, you're certainly not a minority. 26% of people are right there with you. If you're new to beekeeping, that's to be expected. You should expect to lose a lot of bees your first few years. That's just part of the beekeeping journey, and uh, it, it happens to everybody. So um, super interesting there, uh, but the majority of you are saying your bees are a little bit better this year. So, um, Cayman, if you want to uh, come on to the the show, um, feel free to to jump on for a second, and and then we will um, jump in and out of the PowerPoint presentation as as we go along. Here, are you with us, Cayman? I am. I will need someone to let me use my video if you'd like that. I don't know if we want to see your face, Cayman. We might just want to hear your voice. Uh, <laughs> so it's going to be like that, is it? And I laugh it's, too. It's <laughs> just going to be one of those. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to see how to uh, allow you to show show your video. Um, let's see. I can change panelist appearance. Um, I don't think we want to do that. We want to we want to leave your appearance as close as we can. I'm going to make yeah, you a yeah. co-host. Uh, I'm going to make you co-host and that should give you some ability to share your camera there. Oops. There, there we, we go. go. All right. Fantastic. Co-host. Now you're in for and it. And yes, now you can, uh, you can kick us out and, and take over the, take over the webinar. Right. But, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us though. It's great to see you. Well, it's good to see you and great presentation. The video was some really good information and I would like to just, say a thing or two about that if that's okay just some of the observation I, I saw um, hey, if you don't mind though came in before in, in case there, there might be like two people that don't know who you are 
Um, and I failed to give an introduction to, uh, to who you are. So if you don't mind, just introduce yourself real quick and, and tell us a little bit about, um, I'm just calling it, I'm sorry, I'm calling it the B Expo. Um, hey, that's what I'm the, calling it. I'm not taking the time okay. to do that. <laughs> so uh, but, give us a second and then we'd love to hear your comments on the video. Absolutely. So I'll keep it quick. Laurel and I, that's my wife. We keep about 300 hives of bees here in Tennessee. We don't do pollination like the crazy people at the bee supply and uh, all that. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's too much work for us. But we, we focus primarily on nucleus colonies, honey production, and honeybee education. I have a YouTube channel. I just came on Reynolds, and we do a lot of videos, uh, short videos, long videos, and basically just trying to show folks what it takes to keep our bees alive here in Tennessee. And we bring a lot of people on sometimes like Blake's to give more perspective about the commercial side of beekeeping and Texas beekeeping, because it adds a lot of value since we're pretty limited. We'll also bring people on from up north. So if you're a, a northern beekeeper or a Yankee or both, you can get some information for you. And then the Bee Expo is kind of an extension of our YouTube. We had a lot of people asking to do in-person meetings and, and various things. And my wife said, let's do a little conference or something. And I said that was a bad idea. But once I realized she was right yet again, uh, I, did, I, I really have put 110% of our effort into growing what is probably now one of the biggest conferences in North America, and that is the North American Honeybee Expo. We have right now, if the conference was held this week, it'd be 2,600 people. And Amazing. we have crazy... Uh, amounts of vendors. Uh, you all are going to be there uh, with bells on uh, quite a large booth. And Sherry sounds like she's going to be there. So if you would like to thank, uh, and well, Blake, you're speaking there this year, you're VIP. Uh, I'm going to have to even yeah. roll out the red carpet. I, I heard that I heard the private jet will pick me up from the DFW yeah. airport. So I'm, well, I'm really you know, excited. unfortunately, there's been a, a mishap there. It was a different Blake that I was, oh, that was shoot. for. Oh, yeah, well, that's okay. Yeah, um, but we'll, we'll we'll still feed you dinner or something. We got like McDonald's nearby, Love and McDonald's. all that to say, you know, if you want to meet Blake or Sherry in person, you can and say, "Hey, we love your stuff." You can buy stuff from them there as well. You guys are going to have all kinds of gear, and there's 121 companies right now, and I have at least five or six pending. So. If it's anything that you've ever wanted to see in person, you're going to see it. And if it's stuff that you don't even know that exists, but you'd like to see more stuff that's out in the world, we have that too. It's like 21 countries represented right now. It is just a big celebration of, of beekeeping in one place, and that's going to be in Louisville, Kentucky, January 4th, 5th, and 6th, and like 30 talks from speakers like Blake – topics on commercial beekeeping all the way down. We'll have guys like Bob Benny, Marla Spivak, experts from the research level all the way down to how to get started in beekeeping. So it's it's just a lot of fun. And, and we don't like being bored. So uh, be prepared to... It's, it's like drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> it's it's a lot, but it's it's a lot of fun. Absolutely. I couldn't recommend all of you guys being there that are listening and we'll certainly be promoting it with emails and on our YouTube channel. And, um, and I certainly recommend everybody follow Cayman. So Cayman does an incredible job of, he has hundreds of videos, far more entertaining than mine. Um, and so I highly recommend uh, I wouldn't, uh, his channel. I wouldn't say that. I laugh at your videos a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm just saying because you're here. You should see what I say when, when you're not on. That's, the uh, that's so. exactly uh, right. Yeah. All the short <laughs> jokes start coming out. So uh, all that to say, uh, we really respect everything that you guys do. And it's great to collaborate with you again. There's a really big uptake in education in the bee industry. And you mentioned this earlier, mm -hmm. and this is kind of segueing into that bee yard Please. video that you did. Yeah is it takes some time to get good at anything. You don't just all of a sudden pick up a set of golf clubs and you become good at golf. You don't all of a sudden become good at sewing or any other type of hobby or venture that you get into. So beekeeping's no different. 
But if you stick with some good education, you're going to get there. And there's so much opportunity, no matter how you define your success, whether you're wanting three hives of bees and you're just wanting to make some honey for friends and family and for yourself, and primarily just keep bees alive to pollinate the local acorns for the squirrels and deer and pollinate your garden. You know, and if that's what your success is, these people can show you if you're wanting to become the next Blake Shook, well, you, you know, they can probably show you how to do that too. And, and that's what our expo and our channel and the collaboration is all about is it's important to Blake and I, who started in our uh, early years. Um, I, I, were you a teenager or were you a little younger than that, Blake? Uh, I was 12. So almost a teenager. Close enough. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we both started, I started when I was 14 and that really helped us out quite a bit. And, but it, it takes some time to get all this learning uh, to, to where you're at the point where you can keep your bees alive and the colonies that you showed in that yard, the ones with those good brood patterns. If I'm seeing that this time of the year with that much food, those bees are going through winter unless uh, the queen runs out of gas or something like that. There's in the South, we don't have those negative 40 degree temps. I'm, I'm not really worried about any colonies that look that good this time of the year. Those are some good looking bees, but that doesn't happen with the last three to four weeks of work that you've done, Blake. Those bees have been in a good condition for a couple of brood cycles prior at least. And that comes from having a great queen in there, which they obviously do. It comes from having plenty of nutrition to have that good brood. And they had plenty of weight on them and you're, you're feeding them some pollen patties on probably from time to time and also having low mite counts and low pest problems. And it's, that's the fundamentals that everyone from guys running 10,000 hives all the way down to the two hives have to live by is great Queens dead mites and good nutrition, in my opinion. And if you do those things, you can be wildly successful. And one last thing I'll say, and then we'll just go wherever you want, Blake is in the fall, you were talking about combining bees back together. And that's what we're doing. That's what you either combine them back or you're, the, the, the winter is going to take them one way or the other, um, some of those weaker colonies. And that's just the natural course of beekeeping. However, part of the natural course of beekeeping is in April and May and those spring months is increase. And it's very easy to split bees in those spring months when bees want to swarm and, and slightly mm -hmm. after when there's good nutrition. And I encourage everybody on here to continue to watch Blake, see what he does, and maybe watch a video or two of ours because that's the time of the year that you need to increase and plan for these occasional fall and winter losses. And if you want five hives and you go into fall with eight because you made three spring increases, well, you can lose three and you're still where you're at. And I highly recommend... Uh, kind of planning on that if you want to be sustainable because you know Blake's just selling too many bees and we, we've got to help him with that no no all right enough said no that's good no I want to ask you I'm just curious um and we'll I think I have a slide later on combining but we may jump around a little bit tonight what what do you feel like because this is a question I always have whether it's commercially or the hives in my backyard what do you feel like your success rate on combining hives is? So you've got that three to four frame hive in October and you combine it with another hive. Um, well, I'm going to ask you two questions, actually. One is, do you combine two weak hives together or do you combine a weak hive with a strong hive? And then either way, what do you feel like your actual success rate is in, in getting that combined hive into the spring the next year? Well, I never combine two wheat colonies together. I just don't do it. And we have a, a saying around here, we focus on our champs and not our wimps. And I used to focus the majority of my effort on fixing the wimps and my best bees were neglected consequently. And so I don't want to combine two weak colonies together personally. It's not that it can't be done, but it depends on how weak they are. Now, as far as my combination success rate, if the hive that I'm combining is, let's say, three frames of bees, four frames of bees, and they don't have a queen or they have a really poor one, and but that's the only issue, I'm going to do a paper combine. And I find that if this is one of the instances where giving the colony a little bit of feed and a little bit of maybe a pro health or a honeybee healthy or whatever it is, 
for that um, essential oil to kind of, and, and the feed primarily to just help those bees combine. That's going to be a newspaper combined. I feel like I do have a really good success rate, very high end success rate with the paper and combined. Now, if I just shake the bees in this time of the year, well, sometimes if it's really strong robbing, then it's just going to be um, Armageddon and there's just going to be like thousands of bees just battling it out. And um, in Tennessee, that's illegal. I know some people think that we're pretty wild up here, but you can't do that. Um, well, not film it and do pay-per-view. <laughs> So, uh, and uh, what, what, so of those hives you combine, what do you, what percentage do you feel like overwinter successfully and come out on the other side? Well, I'm only combining two strong colonies that should have survived anyways. So gotcha. it should be a pretty good success rate, very good success rate, because I'm not going to combine to two hives. that I think both neither one have a good chance of overwintering. I'm not, I just yeah. never do that. So if I combine to a colony that like those colonies that you had right there, with those good brew patterns, uh, that's those are the kind of colonies I'm going to combine with. And I'm going to take that three frames of bees, newspaper, combine those together, and they're going to integrate, and it'll be just fine. Now, if there's any disease problems, this is a totally different situation. I will never combine. If there's a lot of mites in there, if there's European fowl yeah. brood, anything like that, uh, we're not going to do it. Honestly, um, we will use formic acid in these uh, cases to if it's varroa to crush varroa mites, and if it's European fowl brood, a lot of times I go ahead and throw a hot dose of formic in there as well. Um, mm -hmm. Some people yeah. will say that this is brutal. However, that colony is going to die regardless. And this is a way formic can sterilize stuff in high dosages. And then I can use that equipment later. And I think part of beekeeping is realizing that losses are part of the game. When I was raising chickens, it was the same thing. And if you're in agriculture, losses and death are a part of creation slash life. So I think it's part of the balance. And we definitely try to save every colony that we can, but uh, it doesn't matter how good you are, you're going to lose some bees. Yeah. And I think a good beekeeper takes those losses um, proactively. And, and you're not, again, spending a lot of time and money trying to save hives that probably aren't going to survive. So um, looking at a few of these slides here, I'm just interested to get your opinions too. But as we think about what our bees need to survive the winter, you know, in, in our area of the South, usually it's 30 to 40 pounds, you know, mites under two per hundred bees. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's the minimal bee population for you, Cayman? That, that you're saying, okay, under this bee population, I'm going to combine them or, or shake them out. What, what, what are you looking for usually? What's the lowest population? Yeah, typically anything that's uh, five frames of bees or lower, um, we're, we're going to combine. Uh, we will run some nukes through the winter, and it just depends, right, on the type of five frames of bees. If I'm going to a five-frame nuke and there's three frames of calved brood or close to it, like what you showed, then I'm like, oh, yeah, these these girls are good. If I go in there, there's it's spotty brood patterns and there's five frames of bees. It's different because there's winter bees and there's healthy bees on the way. And then you have, you know, then there's just five frames of old bees and none of those bees are making it through winter. And so one of the things that I encourage everyone that's listening to pay attention uh, to what's going on throughout the seasons. So little details really matter over the course of a couple of years. And what you'll find is these 10 frame strong colonies that don't have that healthy brood pattern. They don't have a strong laying queen, or maybe the mites are a little too high. They're going to come out of winter if they do with maybe only three frames of bees. And what happened? It doesn't matter if you've got 10 frames of old bees, all the old bees aren't capable of making it through your winter. You've got to have a strong cluster of young bees. So what I want to see this time of the year is exactly what you showed in your videos. And that was because of all the prep work you did beforehand. If those bees would have had only one fr deep frame of food in August, even if they had a great queen and low mites, they would have held the queen's uh, laying ability back so much, cannibalizing a lot of what she laid because they just knew they couldn't support it. And those colonies, instead of looking like powerhouses, would be the colonies that I would be combining probably. And so those those bees are an ideal situation. So baby your bees, folks, get into them every other week. 
during those summer months. It doesn't have to be long inspections, but definitely take the time to observe where your bees are at. And I, a big colony that has eight frames of bees or more in that July, August, September range never needs to have less than three deep frames worth of food. You know, so uh, bees don't have a very long lifespan. They can't afford to be lean on food for two to three weeks while the beekeeper's off on vacation somewhere. Or, you know, we all get busy. But, you know, they, they're not as hands off as what some people say. In some years, it can be so. But some years, it is totally not that way. So, yes, I agree with everything on this presentation uh, slide. I would like to have maybe a little bit more poundage of honey up here in Tennessee. We do get colder. And so I'm thinking more around 50 to 60 pounds in ideal situations. But a little bit of fondant or, you know, like Stan's soft sugar bricks. I've, I haven't tried his particularly, specifically. They're delicious. Uh, I, you know, I'll let my son figure that one out. He loves the pollen <laughs> sub we make. That's why he's grown to be so big. Um, but you can add those things on. But yeah, 40 to 50 pounds, 50 to 60 pounds would be better. Uh, definitely keep the mites low. Great Queens dead mites, good nutrition, sufficient bee population, five to six plus frames. It's all about the brood right now. If you've got four great frames of brood, then I'm saying, yeah, let them roll with it. If you've got 10 frames of bees and no frames of brood or terrible brood patterns, there's a problem. So the brood is the most critical thing right now. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I, I something I repeat often is that winter preparation begins in July. You know, uh, when, or whenever you harvest your honey, even if it's the middle of the summer, that's when winter preparation begins. And like yeah, you said, a lot line. of people, yeah, that, that cold front blows in and everybody goes, oh, I, gotta, I better go get my bees ready for winter. And it's over at that point. You know, if you had high mites and not enough food back in July and August, your bees may still be there, um, but they're not going to, they're not going to be in any condition to survive the winter. And so, yeah, it's got to start early. Mm -hmm. um, what about, and we, I talked about this in a video, but how often do you see honey bound hives? How do you deal with that? What do you watch for? Is it something you never see? Um, talk about honey bound hives a little bit. Oh boy, all the hard questions tonight. So the, the <laughs> honey bound hives is something that we deal with. So I was talking to a commercial beekeeper in the Memphis Delta area where they make the cotton and soybean honey. Mm -hmm. And you know, they try to get fall honey some years. And he was extracting a couple hundred supers today, but they were only about half full. But they put them on, and this year was a bust. You know, they most of the hives didn't even fill the supers halfway full. But last year, they did really good off of the fall flow. Mm. The year before was a bust. And so the fall flow is really, I think, personally in Tennessee, more missing than hitting. But every three to four years, you will get a good year. And we never try to take fall honey ourselves. But last year, we had such a good fall flow unexpectedly that we were going and throwing supers on just so that they would move that nectar up into the honey supers instead of backfilling the brood nest. And so that's the real trick with beekeeping, right? Is we can't, we can go up there, out there and observe the flowers and go, wow, that goldenrod and the wing stem, everything's looking really good. But then the week that it blooms, the floor drops out from underneath everything and it's it's dropping down in the 40s at night and it's we get a lot of rain and it doesn't perform or maybe we don't you know we don't get enough rain so really the only way that you can handle these situations is to get into your bees and that's why i recommend every other week even in the summer months um every week would be even better but minimum every other week and go in there and what you'll find is if let's say you have 10 colonies and you know, you're always going to have some in certain stages and others and other stages. Try to keep all your equipment uniform and go into this one, pull out a full frame of food and give it to one that's a little bit light and 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 swap it over. And it's a little bit tricky, but uh, it's just like anything else in life. Uh, you get kind of out of your bees what you put into them. So go out there and sweat. Yep, that's that's the key. Oh, yeah, were you I, wanting I uh? Were you wanting an easy way to deal with this? Because there isn't one. <laughs> no, I, I, oh, hey, I, I wish there was. If there was an easy way, I, yeah, I'd probably be doing something else. Um, sure, sure. Yeah, no, I, I see honey-bound hives um, 
Well, kind of all the time, dear. I, to, to me, it's the worst when I, there's an unexpected honey flow. And sometimes you can see that, you know, the honey flow goes a week later than you expected. Sometimes if you get a lot of summer rain, you can have it in the summer. I see fall flows unexpected. But when I, when I don't have my boxes ready to go and there's an unexpected fall or summer flow, and then they're filling up the brood nest. And, and that's tricky in the fall because we're not usually adding supers in most cases. And, and so I, I agree with you. Checking your bees every two weeks is, is really, really important to make sure that you stay ahead of them, add boxes, or you're shuffling, hunting around. Um, so there you, was, sorry, just real quick good. to go on, along that line. A guy was asking me last night, what about if you're in a double deep situation, typically the majority of the honey will, is going to go into that top deep box. And, but that queen several times is wanting to be up there in that second deep box too. And that's where if you feed and then you have a fall flow there can be major backfilling and then even though the colony is healthy they're gonna have a much smaller winter cluster because you just didn't have room yeah. to lay so he was asking well what about moving some brood around and checkerboarding and that's just a terrible idea um, especially this time of the year but i'm a big proponent of not messing with the integrity of the brood nest so we are not going to be putting empty frames in between brood what we would do though let's say there's a room in that bottom deep box we're, we can go down there and like okay here's a couple combs that don't really have a lot in them we can pull them up and replace that with some honey temporarily and then put that at the edge of the brood nest the queen can lay into that i'm not going to shift a whole box around or anything like that again we don't want to mess with the thermal dynamics of what the bees are trying to do uh, but you can do something like that. However, once the season's done, if they eat a lot of that honey up there, you'll want to probably pull those frames of honey back up because that's where they would prefer to have them. But it, it's a lot of work. Um, the best thing to do is have a lot of extra combs. Yeah, totally agree. A lot of what a lot of people don't remember as well is that bees actually need some empty frames or somewhat empty frames to cluster. You know, because in the wintertime, those bees are going headfirst into those cells um, and the bees are clustering around them. And uh, you need some empty frames in there in the brood nest area that aren't completely True. full of honey as the bees cluster. And so, um, yeah, you just want to be careful not to overfeed, you know, go for that 40 to 60 pound excess. But but don't don't go over that. It's super important. Um, do, do you ever see I'm curious uh, before we talk about pollen substitute a little bit? Have you ever had hives being uh, that are pollen bound? They're bringing in, I usually just see it in the fall, but they're bringing in so much pollen that they actually have like four or five frames completely full of pollen and they're pollen bound. It's um, not as common for us in the fall, but we have issues with it uh, with all of the hardwoods that we have here. And I'm in an area where it's just trees, trees, trees. We don't have commercial agriculture. We're mostly hills, very small pastures. So since we have, we have so much hardwoods, and vines, we end up with pollen bound issues a lot in late March and early April. Mm. And we actually pollen trap these days to try to alleviate that. And, but in the fall, that's unusual for us, but they usually do sock a, a decent bit of pollen in that bottom deep though. You'll go down that bottom deep and there will be three, sometimes as many as five frames of bee bread. And I would love to see more research on that. I, because I, I feel like a lot of it's still there come January and then February when we get, you know, it doesn't matter that the day length's getting longer in February. They won't just consume that bee bread and start raising tons of brood. It, they ha they wait until that fresh pollen comes in before they go crazy. So I would love to know more about that relationship. So you guys are having, is this normal for you guys to have a bunch of? Uh, I wouldn't say it's pollen bound issues. I would say maybe one in every three years I see it where we have such an intense fall pollen flow that as the bees are shutting down for the winter, they're just back, almost backfilling with pollen. And and that's, I usually move cool. pollen frames around like I would honey frames in those situations. But I don't normally see it in the spring though. So, so I need to bring my bees to you for spring and you can bring yours to Texas. No, for the fall. no, we, yeah. <laughs> no, um, I, I'm going to the Dakotas. That's what I'm, I'm doing. I, I hear it's just perfect up hey. there. No stress. Although the commercial no beekeepers are like, Hey, 
come on, more people, please. <laughs> oh, we can't wait to get more people up there. You know, I always tell this anecdote that uh, when I first started going to the Dakotas commercially in, oh man, over 10 years ago, probably 15 years ago, we kind of picked an area where there weren't many commercial beekeepers. You know, you try to find your niche up there. And at the back then, you could actually find areas where there weren't that many commercial operations. So we kind of found our corner of the state um, and, and got a bunch of bee yards where there weren't other beekeepers. And then every year, just one or two new beekeepers have moved in. And they're now on some of the yards, you can stand up on the back of our flatbed truck and you can count five to 600 beehives just from what you can see uh, from, from one bee yard. And um, now that, to be fair, there's like four trees in North Dakota. So you can see pretty much all the way to Canada. Uh, that is... but, uh, <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're seeing a good ways, but, but it is amazing how, how many people move their bees up there in the summer, but it's 75 degrees in August. So it's nice. And, and, and for those in the crowd who may not understand why it's a sweet clover, um, yes. primarily yeah. and, some people are like, well, it's it's hard on the bees to truck them up there, and and it is stressful on the beekeeper and the bees to do that. However, when you go through a period of stress like the bees might do on a trip like that, but you hit pollen-rich forage and nectar-rich forage, that's providing you everything you need for prime nutrition, and that just fixes things right on up. And yeah, we we we've, we've done many tests where you know we take a bunch of hives up north. We leave a bunch in Texas over the summer. The bees that have gone north always outperform and do better and survive better than the bees left in, in the south where it's 100 degrees with very little flow for three months. That's just brutal on bees. Mm -hmm. And so even though moving bees is stressful, um, it's like, well, moving to Hawaii is stressful, but you know, once you get there, it's kind of worth it. Um, yeah, besides it's the, the politics, the but you know, we won't oh, get we into won't that. There. <laughs> um, now, um, just for some clarification, I don't get a, a flow of real good pollens or real good nectar from June 15th to about the first end of the first week of September. So we, I don't think we have quite probably as long as a dearth period as some parts of Texas, but we do actually experience a it's very commonplace for at least two good months of dearth here. And yeah. that is the toughest point. And here in Tennessee, still the education's always focused on, oh, winter, and I my the winter was so rough this year. But I, I promise you, if you're a southern beekeeper and you conquer July, August, and September, and you dominate taking care of your, your bees in those months, you are going to find that you're wildly more successful than you are right now. Totally agree. So kind of leading into that, what do you do about fall pollen substitute? Do you use it? Do you love it? Do you hate it? When do you use it? How much do you use? What's your recommendation when it comes to pollen sub? Well, I really like the stuff and it's a supplement. It's called pollen substitute, as you know, but truth be told, it is a supplement that when it performs the best is when there is some natural pollen either in the combs as bee bread or there is uh, some little bits of pollen coming into the hive because not all pollens are created equal. So I'm, I'm a big fan of a good pollen sub because this helps smooth things out. And our goal is to have a nice, big, healthy cluster. I would love to look into my bees in January and see seven, eight to 10 frames of a cluster at that point. Cause it, it, in my area, my old bees have died off. So they might've been a double deep in October, but what's, going to really tell all is what they look like in January. You know, do I have a two frame cluster? Do I have a 12 frame cluster? And nutrition is so paramount to being able to have those winter bees because what really separates winter bees from the, the rest of the bees is socking away copious amounts of fats and nutrition in their fat body organ. And so if the pollen patties are filling in some nutritional gaps where we have had periods of drought or whatever, then I, I really like it. And pollen patties to me are to be used during the most critical times in the year. So if coming out of winter is when I use them the most and going into winter is when I use them the most. And if I had to pick one of those, I would going into winter would be the most valuable time to use them. And I don't shirk on expense on the pollen patties. I 
uh, we'll spend a little bit more for a higher quality pollen patty. If I'm going to take the time to do it, I want something that's going to get the most bang for my buck. So as far as how much am I feeding, probably start feeding in an average year, mid-September pollen patties in my area. A little bit earlier won't hurt. And then I'm going to go probably until about the end of this month. Um, and a lot of it is weather dependent and what I'm seeing inside the hives and how much I'm going to feed. We also have small hive beetles to think of. And so we have to have a good bit of small hive beetle control or just really robust colony. So I, I personally recommend a little bit of both, a little bit of small hive beetle control and also dicing up the patty. So let's say we, we use the global one pound patties. Um, with the rocket yeah. fuel. And so I slice them into four sections and that creates more surface area and we'll have double deep colonies and we'll run them in between. And since there's so much more surface area, the global, I use the 4%, um, the 15% is really good too, but the 4% will give you almost as quick as speed consumption as the 15%, but there definitely is an advantage over the 0% to the 4% on how fast they consume it. And so using that 4%, I get some speed surface area. I get some speed, strong bees that are healthy. It's going to give me a lot of speed. And, and therefore I have very, very little small hive beetle problems. And that extra pound of protein mixed with the real pollen, a pound of pollen, they say nutritious pollen can give you about a pound of bees. You know, I don't know if that's exact, but that's typically the theory is a pound of pollen, like a uh, a frame of honey and a frame of pollen is like a frame of bees. Mm -hmm. I don't know how accurate that is, but it's kind of what they've said for a long time. So I'm going with it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a pretty good so investment. It is a big investment. So if I feed three pounds of pollen between September and October, three to four pounds, plus what they're bringing in too, boy. Three pounds, that, that's like a package of bees right there. Yeah, it is. And, it's you huge. know, if I'm, you know, so my my goal is to get, you know, if I can get an extra two frames of bees going into winter, maybe I get an eight frame cluster instead of six frames. Well, boy, they're going to be really resilient. And not only that, when that queen starts laying in February off that maple pollen, she's got a lot more frame coverage. Therefore, she can lay more on that first round and then it multiplies, boom, boom, boom. And now I've got to deal with swarming in March. And I make some splits and then I sell them to people. And, and that's kind of how we get things going. So, uh, yeah, I'm a really big fan of pollen patties. Yeah. Love that. I, I have no disagreement with, with anything you said there. So I, I absolutely love that. Um, uh, another topic there in, is just hive wraps, moisture boards, upper entrances. You know, a lot of people are, especially newer beekeepers can be confused by, this because you read a lot of the beekeeping books, which it seems like they're all written from a northern perspective, which is great for northern beekeepers. Um, and they talk about wrapping hives and tar paper, um, moisture boards, etc. Uh, and and even in the north, those things are a little more debated now than they used to be. You know, I think old mm -hmm. school would have been, you know, wrap everything to death. And uh, you've got to be really careful doing that. There, there's some downsides to it. You know, you can have the moisture buildup in the tops of the hives. You know, people often don't realize that the bees are only keeping the cluster warm. They're not keeping the entire inside of the box warm. Um, what are your thoughts on upper entrances, moisture boards, hive wraps? Um, use it, don't, good, bad. Yeah. Another hard question. Thank you for that, Blake. I, I picked the so, hardest tonight. Yeah. I yes, mean, I, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So 100%, first of all, this is going to be redundant, but it doesn't matter if you got a $1,000 beehive with insulation and gizmos that are tell you the humidity and all the sensors in the world. If your bees stink on the inside of that $1,000 hive, they're dead. And so I have 30 hives that are... Um, what is it? An R rating of eight and some that are in the R rating of seven. So a standard Langstroth wooden three quarter inch box is about a rating of one. So these are seven to eight times more insulating than a, a standard box. 
and I bees will die in those just as good as anything. However, you can definitely tell there are some advantages to them. Uh, the bees during really hot periods of time, they aren't quite as stressed. Um, like the, I know you guys, I think at least at one point you guys were selling the Apame style of hives and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so I have 26 of those and then one of the seven frame nukes. And when we get those stupid hot days, like a hundred odd degrees and humidity is high, always high here, there's hardly any bees bearding on those hives. And then my wooden hives, there's enough bees on the entrance to shake a package almost. And so that's more stress on the bees. Now, 21 years I've been in beekeeping and 99% of my hives run those three quarter inch wooden boxes. So you can totally do it. Um, most everybody does. That all to say, the bees are the most important part of this formula of successful overwintering. Now the, the upper entrance is helpful um, in certain circumstances. I think if you have a well insulated lid and you have a season like ours, it is not needed because the problem with the condensation is that hot air can hold more moisture in it, more water. And the bees are producing hot air and producing water vapor. And that leaves the cluster and goes on up and it hits a cold lid or inner cover. And then it rapidly shrinks and that water vapor condenses on the inner cover or lid. And that drips down on your bees. But what if you had a foam board or an insulated lid to where it does not hit a cold lid and instead it continues to roll away from the lid and then hit the cold walls and then drain down the walls like you would like it to. So there's a lot of different techniques that are utilized. I, I know beekeepers that are in Canada and Finland and Sweden who do no, uh, no upper entrances. However, their winters are very dry and you can have snow, but it can be a very dry winter. And then you have some guys who are in a very moist area for winter. So you have to know your area, right? And you got to watch those YouTubers, man. I mean, they'll just tell you anything just to get a click. Exactly, and so, man. The, the middle yeah. picture here is actually Canada, New Brunswick. So those, those uh, poor guys. Yeah, my goodness. But yeah. I, I totally agree. Yeah, your geography makes such a difference. It does. 100%. So learn and don't just, you know, I'm not trying to be mean to anybody out there, but don't learn from the guy that, at your B club that's got five years experience and, you know, everyone treats him like he's an expert, um, but he, there's no proof of that. Learn from somebody who's been overwintering for a long time and there's good proof that they're successful. And my theory is if you want to be successful at something, you got to learn and hang around the people who are successful. So uh, moisture boards, I'm not really a big fan of it personally. Um, some people really like them. Uh, hive wraps, I've never had to do that here. I really shouldn't even talk about that because I don't know much about it at all. Um, that would be a, a topic for somebody else, to be honest. I just don't know. But I'll see people spend $40 on some type of upper moisture board or quilt board and uh i don't know i just think that it's way too expensive and way overkill so i don't use yeah. but just a tiny little upper entrance and if i have it insulated i don't use an upper entrance at all and i do just fine yeah no, i'm i'm right there with you a couple of rapid fire ones um what do you do with the hive that you find is queenless in october I combine it to a strong, healthy colony as long as there's no disease or varroa problems. Beautiful. Yep, I'm right there with you. Um, let's hit a couple other quick topics. What do you do with hives this time of year? Hives, lots of hives start dying this time of year. And you've got one with wax moth damage, one with small high beetle damage. What do you do to clean those up? Bonfires? Uh, <laughs> kids no, that pick no. everything out? Uh, chickens? Ew. <laughs> uh, no. So first of all, I say shoot and fooey when I see this and with you, it depends on the damage. Like this one on the left looks like it might be able to be salvaged. Um, now if you have plenty of excess combs, go ahead and pop the foundation out and just reuse the frame. And you can reuse the comb if you want to take the time to scrape the wax off and all that kind of stuff. 
but if if there's a lot of damage then we just go ahead and pop the foundation out and reuse the frame i don't care um, i definitely don't torch anything it's not like wax moss like some people will literally tell you to torch the entire inside of the box with a flamethrower if there's wax moss or small high beetles that does that is nothing it's every sink it is inter it, it it's starting to hurt man i get so many emails <laughs> now of where their local guru told them to burn their brand new equipment from spring they bought from texas oh or the bee supply and they've got hundreds of dollars wrapped up into this and it still has so much value and some guru on facebook told them to burn it and then they send me a a picture of what it was like and i'm like half of these combs were salvageable and just because the combs you know dark brown doesn't mean there's anything bad with it i've ran combs that were over a decade old before i'm not recommending everybody do that necessarily but uh, there's a you have to be careful with the online stuff. So the main thing I'm going to do with this is pop the foundation out. But if there's small hive beetles, I'm just going to kind of rinse it with water a little bit and then shake the water out because that left comb doesn't look that damaged. There's some wax moth damage. It looks like there's a little bit of slime on it, maybe from the wax, uh, the uh, hive beetles. But that yeast that the hive beetles secrete is super off pit putting. So if you don't kind of rinse it out. The bees really don't want to fool with it. So, and and then you don't give it to a wheat colony either. If you if you have a, a frame like that, you you don't give them just a ton at once unless it's just perfect conditions. Uh, ideally, anything that you've got to pull this time of the year, use some paramoth on it, freeze it. If you have the space and your wife or your husband is very forgiving of the mess you are fixing yeah. to create for them. And protect these combs at all costs. It's the second most valuable asset that you have uh, besides your bees. And uh, I'm a big, big fan of making lots of comb. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. No, I you, I have nothing to add. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love rinsing those small high beetle slime frames out, shaking the water out, freezing them, and then, yeah, reusing them even if it's next spring. But, yeah, mm -hmm. I would probably, even like this picture on the right with that wax malt damage, I mean, I would a frame that one's a bit on the verge, but in general, I would still freeze it. And then maybe next spring, I would put it back in with a really strong hive and they'll often pull that webbing out and reuse it. Um, if the webbing's starting to like separate the, the comb from the foundation, that's when I start throwing it away or popping that foundation out. But the bees can really clean up if that if that structure is still intact um, and you freeze it to kill everything, the bees can often rebuild it. But I wouldn't do that this time of year. Um, you know, I'd save it till spring and and then do it at that point. 100%. Uh, Sheila asked yeah. how I protect my comb. Uh, these days, we're just starting to use Paramoth for that. And mm -hmm. you can look at the Paramoth products online and uh, just follow the instructions that they have. It, it works. It's worked for generations of beekeepers. And just make sure that whenever you take them off to put them on for the bees, that you let them air out for a little bit. Um, but uh, we've we've done that for a while now. And it's just it's a lot faster and more reliable so that's what we're doing yeah totally agree we've got a couple minutes left we're close but if you guys have questions for caveman feel free to put them in the chat or the q a um and then we can ask them with a few minutes we have left um i wasn't sure how we uh, how much time we'd have left so uh but we, we're doing we're do no no we're doing really we really good, good. I, you got seven I'm, minutes I'm, i got some questions for y'all okay yeah go ahead Sherry. All right, two of them are the same, so I wanted to kind of combine them. Um, and I don't you know if you want to put yourself out there or not, Cayman, but it's about the OA sponge. Do you have you heard any update from from Cameron Jack or anything about the yeah, somebody Alfred just asked that as well. I'll tell yeah. extended relay release testing. Yeah. yeah, so there's a couple of questions regarding that. So I'll try to make these as quick as I can, but there's a lot of details. So oxalic acid extended release, we tried that out last year. And the the trick with any of these extended release products, whether it's Randy Oliver's method or a diff, different method, is you can't wait till the mite levels are high. They they it's not a big knockback. And I've talked to a lot of different people, North Carolina commercial beekeepers, guys in Alberta that have ten thousand hives that are doing this <clears throat> off label, and um, and they have a lot of information. But the extended release stuff is a it's a slow 
kill. It's it's not you drop it in there and might just start falling off the bees like mad. And so if you have relatively low mite loads, this can be really useful in keeping them low for even a longer period of time, but it's not going to uh, bludgeon them quickly. And so there is some really promising stuff, and I actually have a speaker coming to my conference this year. One of them is Dr. Cameron Jack, but there's another one who's a commercial beekeeper who will be speaking, and they have some really awesome information related to extended release and the future of it. And I can't tell you right now because I promised them that I wouldn't, but I think I know for the Canadians, it's coming soon and hopefully here in the U.S. And while we're on the point of tablets, Stan Gore asked about the uh, APA tablets. Um, I was sent several of these. Ah, thymol. So first of all, what do I think about them? I was sent some uh, recently. I was about last month. And there's I, it's, you don't have enough time to test them from September to now. Uh, it takes a lot of work to truly test something. I hate... Uh, seeing YouTubers who get a product and before they even really know what it does, they start making YouTube videos of it. So there's products that we've been testing all season long. We haven't even made a video on because I'm not going to tell you to try something until I've tested it. Oh, by the way, did I mention these aren't legal to use in the United States for mites, but uh, some people like are skirting around the, the fact they're a supplement. So uh, <clears throat> that being said, you got to be careful because just because so, some YouTuber or some company says that they work, uh, maybe they're profiting off of that, and there's not always the research and the truth behind it. And I would just echo that in that we've we've been testing those. We we try not to sell anything that we haven't tested and that we wouldn't use in our own operation. And so we've been testing those Apple tablets for a couple months now, um, mm -hmm. and. I'm with you in that I really want to get it next spring and into the early summer before we make an official recommendation. Um, our fall results weren't, weren't great. Um, and so I'm not saying they're not a good option. I think it, if, if it works, it's going to be a very slow option. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Don't do those YouTuber things that they do just to get the views. But you know what they remind are you me one, of? Are you one of those Tide Pod guys? Or are you one of those YouTube Tide Pod <laughs> guys? No. Okay. I just, just thought of something sure. clever to say, but I decided it was probably not the right time <laughs> to say it. And so they, these remind me of like the urinal wafers that you. Oh, that, okay. That's exactly what I thought when I saw them. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm so, so sorry. I, I, I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> so our testing yeah. is, I, I wouldn't say that they don't work. I guess I'm just, I'm echoing what you're saying and that be careful, test it carefully. Um, we'll, we'll carry them or not. We'll, we won't decide till spring, but we won't carry them unless they really work and jury's out at the moment. Jury's mm -hmm. out. We're, we've yeah. got, James has a feral hive that he tested. He's testing them on too. Just to, yeah, we'll throw your, throw our input in. So uh, we've got like two minutes. So you want these last two questions real quick? Give us a couple quick ones. All right. Um, well, how many single five frame newts do you overwinter, Cayman? This year, I'm not doing a whole lot. I've put a lot more effort into the conference, but in the past, we typically try to run 50 or more, um, actually double deep five over five, because I want to get them about eight to 10 frames strong. So then when those old bees die off, I can pull the second box off the top if I want to, and I'm still going to have at least a four to five frame cluster. Mm -hmm. And those bees are awesome. Last This last spring, I had a nice cluster of about six to seven good bees that went queenless over winter somehow. Maybe I accidentally crushed her. I was able to plug one of those nukes in and get a full honey crop off of it because it was a great queen that had the whole package with her. And now I just didn't lose a step in that uh, production yard. That's awesome. Well, the last question I think is the, the most important question of the night. Is there any chance you'll ever bring the expo to Texas? Well, you know, George Strait said across the room. Yeah, yeah. All my exes live in Texas. I don't have any exes. <laughs> like to keep it that way. Um now all jokes aside, Texas I have talked to people about conference centers in Texas, and it's definitely not out of the question. When you put on a conference like we do and have as many vendors as we do, there's a lot of logistics to consider. 
first of all, we have to get a big crowd. We're demanding a lot out of these companies if they're bringing in semi loads, and I expect at least 30 semi loads of product this year on the floor, then we've got to have the numbers of people. And, you know, Texas is a little far away from, and I need the people to drive too. So they'll buy the product and haul it home. I can't have it in Southern Florida or Southern Texas. And the people from up North have to drive 20 hours to get there. They'll fly, but then they won't buy. So it's a little bit of a delicate balance. However, I do have an idea for something in Texas and Blake and I are going to be talking about it and it may happen and I may see you there. And then you'll realize that though I'm probably eight inches shorter than Blake or seven, somewhere around there, depends on if he's wearing cowboy boots. <laughs> um, I just spent more energy on higher brain function. That's all it was. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. With I, that, I, I'm sorry. On that not. note, uh, <laughs> yeah. no, I do want to share an idea we had though uh, for your conference. And we would love to host you in Texas. That We totally got to talk about that more. So we were, we were talking about ideas on how to get people to our booth at the B Expo. And we mm -hmm. said, you know what? We should have a dunking booth where for $10, uh, you, can, you can dunk Cayman Reynolds in the dunking booth. And then that evolved a bit. So we said, you know what? We shouldn't do a dunking booth. We should do a honey dunking booth. We should have a barrel of honey. <laughs> That'd be awful. <laughs> and for enough money, you can dunk Cayman into a barrel of honey. So I'll, I'll visit with you later about that. But we thought it was a pretty good idea. Well, uh, it's, it would be you a know, lot don't, of fun. You know, it has to be U.S. honey. Don't be getting it. Don't be going cheap on me and getting that. Well, uh, no, Hong actually, I was, I was thinking we should do the Hong Kong honey because we don't want to waste good American honey. So we, hey, we this is my this is my skin we're talking about here. <laughs> yeah. I don't want rice syrup, man. Uh, yeah, well, you know, yeah, we'll we'll save that topic for another day. But thank you so much for joining us, Cayman. It was it, as always, it's great to visit with you. Thanks for I know you're busy planning for the conference, so we appreciate your time tonight, uh, and we'd love to have you back at some point. Well, thanks, Blake. Thanks, Cher. You guys are always great, and thanks to your crew. You all keep following Blake and make sure that you get out there and learn from those bees. Absolutely. We'll see you next time, Cayman. And for everybody else, uh, we will see you in November. Um, and if you have any final questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll wrap up and answer those for you. And until then, hopefully it's colder next time when we see you in November. Uh, and, and keep feeding those bees, keep watching those bees. And as always, if you have any questions, concerns, issues in the next month, always reach out to us at the Bee Supply and we would be more than happy to answer questions in the meantime. With that, we'll sign off and see you in November. Have a great night, everybody.